let me pray. But uh, before I pray, I just want to introduce uh, Cheryl to you, although many of you already know her. She, Cheryl is one of our favorite uh, presenters at the CMTA Impact Convention. She's a radio and television personality, an author, speaker, dynamic speaker, and a teacher and a, a motivating leader. To learn more about her radio and television pro a show, Transformed Through Truth, and to learn more about her five books and the many articles she's written, and by the way, she's just published and uh, printed, the, it's just out in June. What is the name of your newest book? Unraveling the Lie Knot. Isn't that wonderful? Unraveling the Lie Knot. We all believe our enemies' lies, and we need to know how to unravel that lie knot. So that's her latest book. Um, you'll also learn about on, on her website about her involvement with Freedom in Christ Ministries and Lead Like Jesus. So I definitely encourage you to look at her uh, website, www. Cheryl GT com and I'll repeat that later. God has used Cheryl to help thousands of people to know Jesus and to grow in Jesus. On a personal note, she was a widow and she and now has a new beginning with her marriage to Dr. Jim Turner and the added joy of 14 grandchildren, which I, I think that's enough to write a book about. Um, mm -hmm. Now, would you like to hear about child rearing from someone who's never had a child but has read all the books? Or would you rather hear from a, a person who's had kids, been in the trenches, knows what it's like to have different kids at different ages and has read all the books but has written them too? Well, <laughs> Cheryl hasn't just read about setbacks. She's experienced them. She's been in the trenches. She knows what it's like to have different kinds of setbacks and has read and written books about them. But she's also experienced the comebacks and she's going to help us uh, move from setback to comeback. We'll open in prayer. Father, thank you so much for um, the joy of knowing you, you as our savior and you as our Lord, you as our personal, uh, our helper, our strength, you who brings us through um, the setbacks and the comebacks, you who we depend on, you the reality of life. We thank you. And we thank you and welcome you to our presence this morning. And we ask that you will, as you do, speak through Cheryl, speak through your word and her experiences and into our hearts that, Lord, each one of us will be able to take home and to apply what we've learned, at least one, at least one thing that will just pierce our hearts uh, so that we know that that's the reason I'm here. This is for me. This is for me to live out. And Lord, that we would be able to do that because you will give us your listening ears right now and open spirit to hear you through Cheryl. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome, Cheryl. Thank you. It's so great to be among so many friends. And Sue forgot to mention a couple of really important things about me. One of those things is that I love coffee. And the <laughs> other thing is that I love chocolate. So, and some of you have heard my long list of chocolate jokes, which I will reserve for another time. But I'm so excited about sharing with you today this topic. And I'm glad you're here. And let me just remind you I am your cheerleader. That's who I am. That's what I will do for you. If you need to be cheered on, I'm your girl, but I'm also someone that knows where to find hope. And I call myself a hope dealer because in my old days as a drug addict, I did the other type of dealing and you guys can fill in that blank four letter word. So anyway, I know where to find hope and it's at the feet of Jesus, our God of hope. And so I will take you to him. He has an endless supply enough for all of us. But the last thing that is so important for you to know about me is I'm also going to tell you the truth. And that's not as if I have not told you the truth in the past. It's that I'm going to direct you to what God's word tells us about his truth for us. And of course, the Holy Spirit 
he's the truth revealer. But when we see it in his word and he confirms that through revealing it, and it it's kind of like an aha moment in our spirit when we go, oh yeah, I've heard this before, but now I actually get it that this is for me for now. So those are so important for us to move ahead. And I know that some of you have some of those same attributes as well. You love coffee, you love chocolate, you're a hope person, uh, and those are all good things. But let me just first share a story of someone that we all know and love who had many setbacks, but he overcame them. And this man lived in the 1920s, okay? He was a literary giant. He was known as Theodore Seuss Giesel. You probably know who it is by that name, but I'm going to just tell you a little bit more about his many overcoming accomplishments before he became the Dr. Seuss that we know and love. He moved to New York City in the 1920s, and it was a very tough time to start his career as a cartoonist. He actually looked for a job for three months and was constantly told no by ad information companies, production places, magazines. He finally landed his first job as a freelance cartoonist for the New York, or I'm sorry, the Saturday Evening Post. Well, years later, his first children's book, and to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street was born, but guess what? He had to overcome 27 rejections. And that's what it's all about is deciding and determining to keep going. His core factors may be those two things, determination and commitment, but with our intent and our decision to include God in the process, it's going to help all of us to start over again. And that's what it's all about is most of us, I'd say all of us have experienced setbacks, right? And we know they're really a part of life. In fact, Jesus tells us to expect them. John 16, 33 says, I have told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So let's just adjust our perspective a little bit here, okay? Think about things from God's point of view. Every setback is a battle that we can win. And in battles, you know, we have tension or conflict, the battle for our minds, the battle for our time, our families, our churches, even our ministries. These things are series of battles that are part of a bigger conflict. And 2 Corinthians 10.4 tells us how to fight. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So in the struggle to overcome and build again, it's important to say, stay encouraged. And that's why it's so important to stay connected with times like this. And that's one thing that I truly enjoy about Zoom is it's easy. And some of us, you know, we may have on our pajama bottoms from the waist down, but that's okay. Maybe we have on our shorts and our flip-flops. It's okay. But at least we look presentable from the top up, right? So, <laughs> and uh, it's all good because when we stay connected through whatever means God is offering us, that's our choice. It's when we get knocked down, not if we get knocked down, but when we do, we can choose to get back up because we've all experienced disappointment, rejection, and loss of direction or control, these things all bring on discouragement. But when we choose to lean into these things and trust God, an amazing thing happens. Our faith deepens, and that's how our setbacks can be a setup for our comeback. And you know what's so good about this is that you can share your victories with others and that is the win that they get encouraged to do the same, to say, hey, I want to, I want to just let God help me do the same thing that you have done. And that is what gives God the glory. So if you have your handout, we're going to look at the familiar strategy of General Joshua. And if you want to open your Bible, you can open with me to Joshua. We're going to look at the last verse in Joshua chapter six and most of Joshua chapter seven. 
So we're really familiar with the battles that Joshua won, specifically the unbelievable victory over Jericho. The last verse of Joshua 6, verse 27, it says, so the Lord was with Joshua and his fame spread throughout the land. Well, so what this means, as you can understand, obviously, it's that Joshua had great favor with God and everybody knew about it. And Israel at that time seemed to be literally unstoppable. It's easy to imagine them moving forward from one city to the next, having one victory after another, but that's not what happened next. In Joshua chapter seven, it begins with a word that's very pivotal. That's the word, but the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the devoted things. And if you look to your handout, I'm going to read it from Joshua 7, 1. But the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. And we can learn from these mistakes of Joshua and the Israelites, because the first thing that we can do to change a setback into a comeback is to actually be mindful, to understand what actually had happened, but also to examine or pay attention to the areas of our lives that are prone to neglect. So as I'm thinking through and in my studies of this passage, I noticed that before we had any details of what was next, we are introduced to the problem. The problem was that the Israelites and everyone was grouped because of one person's sin. The Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the devoted things. Well, you might ask, you know, Bible students, what happened? Achan from the tribe of Judah had stolen some of the things that these people were told not to do when they conquered Jericho. God had commanded them specifically, do not take anything from the city that you destroy. Destroy everything. And why God did that is because God wanted his people to be set apart from other nations. That, that's what they did. They stole and they looted from those nations that they destroyed the Israelites were to obey God without question. Achan ignored this command, and one man's disobedience affected the whole nation. And in the same way for us as individuals, as leaders, we understand that, that sin has a ripple effect. We often think, well, this is just going to impact me. It won't bother anybody else. But it really can, and it does, doesn't it? So with one man's sin, the sin of Achan, it impacted the whole community of Israel, and it was a major setback. But the underlying problem, here's the gist, and what we should notice is the underlying problem here for Achan is neglect. Achan neglected doing what God had commanded. But it wasn't only the negligence of Achan. It was also the negligence of Joshua. Joshua, this incredible leader, had led Israel from the Jordan. And remember, the victory against five kings of Canaan then settled the tribes in the new world. And up until this point, Joshua had been so intentional. He set aside time to seek the Lord. You remember how Joshua did that before he crossed the Jordan? He took three days to prepare emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And then before conquering Jericho, he instructed the whole nation of Israel to renew their covenant. He spent time personally, even face down before the Lord. But now Joshua's victories had made him vulnerable. He became overconfident. He thought he could handle things in his own strength. And in your handout, you see this quote from Mark Batterson from his book, Not Safe. He said, the anointing is the difference between what you can do and what God can do. It's the difference between the temporal and the eternal. It's the difference between success and failure. And for those of us in ministry, this is such a great reminder because every battle needs a fresh anointing. 
And for some of us, like me, creature of habit, if I encounter something that I've gone through before, I think, well, I know what to do. But some of you know those things that kind of have surprised us in the past few years, two years specifically, we haven't known what to do. And for some of us, we've just been, okay, I'm going to do what I think is best. No, we're going to do what our husband, our wife, our pastor says is best. No, I'm going to go before the Lord and ask him, what do you think? I need to do and really ask for God to give us his mind, the mind of Christ, as we're thinking about the new battles that we're facing, because we will be in the next years and months to come, we will be facing a lot of new battles and we need a fresh anointing. We need a fresh look of how the Holy Spirit wants us to look ahead at his direction. So Joshua overlooked or neglected this very important step, and this impacted his next decision. In Joshua chapter 7, verses 2 through 6, we see him without consulting the Lord, he sent out spies. And this was a familiar strategy. We know about how the spies were sent out. But Joshua sent these out into Ai, the same strategy that he used to uh, look at Jericho, what was going on there, and the same strategy that his mentor Moses had used in 40 years before that. But there were noticeable differences. And the first is in the attitude of these spies. Again, they were overconfident. They were proud. They thought, well, no big deal. We've conquered Jericho. This little city of Ai, not a big deal. We can do this. And they really thought that Ai, this city, would be very easy to conquer. You can read all about it in the rest of chapter seven, I'm not going to read all of it, but the gist of it found in Joshua seven, verse three is the report that these spies gave to Joshua was the people of AI are few. They sized them up and they thought, ah, oh, no big deal. We can easily do this. In other words, let our troops rest and recuperate and save their strength for something bigger. Not good. The problem here is that they deferred to presumption instead of faith. Presumption is faith in faith instead of faith in God. Faith in Yahweh is so different than just presuming or going back to what we did before. And I know as our, there are many leaders for our convention, the CMTA, you guys are trying to figure this out. And we, we respect you, we honor you, we pray for you as well, because these are different times. But I know that God is giving all of us a fresh anointing for this new battle that's ahead. So what Joshua too, in his neglect of leadership, was he was really not in tune with what was going on. And I don't know about you, but I've done this many times. Things were happening all around him, and Joshua was literally clueless that disaster was about to strike. He had neglected those important things that as leaders, we cannot overlook prayer. We cannot overlook consecration and our time before the Lord. And I don't know what that looks like for you, but for me, it looks like carving out no matter what comes no matter how tired I am, even if I have to get up an hour earlier, or I'm sorry, an hour later, two hours later, I will not miss out on my time alone with God. It's not about my robot cup of coffee that I have, like literally my coffee is made when I get up. I told you I'm a coffee fiend. But it is about just knowing that because my coffee is ready, so is God. He's ready to meet with me every single morning. And I'm a morning person. Some of you already know that, but I also know that I cannot face anybody else until I've seen my Lord. And I faced him in a very open and honest way as I look into his word, because Valerie knows this. Um, I was one of the uh, attenders of New Life Center and Valerie, you know, Pastor James Ranger, what he would tell us is you read the word and the word reads you. And when God's word reads you, 
you have to be honest with yourself. You can't be clueless like Joshua. And I'm not trying to get down on Joshua because all of us have been there before, but we're using him, him as an example because what he did was instead of devoting himself and the people, because as leaders, what we do affects a lot of other people, right? It does. Joshua should have been preparing himself so that his people could do the same spiritually, emotionally, and physically. What Joshua did was he went with the advice of the spies. If he had taken the time to seek God, it wouldn't have taken him very long to realize that God was not very happy with Israel and that there was sin in the camp. So one of our biggest setbacks as leaders can be in the area of neglect. Things that we neglect always lead to a place of regret, don't they? So let me define neglect. It's a lack of attention to one's thoughts and deeds or a failure to give adequate thought to the consequences of one's actions leading to disturbing results. Okay, we've all been careless. In fact, a survey done by CARMD showed that 10% of those that were polled were driving with their check engine light on. Anybody done that? Yeah, me too. Okay, and out of that 10%, half of the cars were showing signs of a breakdown. Woohoo! And they indicated that their warning lights had been on for over three months. Oh boy. Now you're getting there, right? I, some of you were like, yep, that's me. Well, I'm with you. Another 10% said their warning lights had been on one to two months and that the reason that most people ignored the warning light is because they did not think that their car had a serious problem. So I guess neglect doesn't impact our cars, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> So, but what happens when we neglect things like our own personal spiritual walk? Not good. I'm not a very nice person to live with when I do that. What about our spouses? When we neglect time cultivating our relationship with our spouses or our children or taking care of our finances and Psalms talks about this in watching over our flocks, like the shepherd watches over his flocks. The same thing. The consequences of not taking care of these things is we may end up in regret. And God has an answer for our neglect and lack of follow through. And so if you look down in Joshua chapter seven, verse six, when Joshua gets the news of how AI had defeated Israel, he went into mourning because like his spies had told him, this was going to be easy peasy. And it turned out different than Joshua had planned. So in Joshua 7, verse 6, Joshua tore his clothes and he fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there all evening. Literally, he was confused by God. And so the questions began. That's what we do. When things don't go our way, even if we don't talk to God about it, we ask God, why, why, why? Why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of our enemies? Joshua says this, we would have been content on the other side of the Jordan. Are you kidding me? They would be content living in the wilderness again? I don't think so. And this brings us to our next point, of how do we change a setback to a comeback? Number one, we're mindful. We pay attention to areas that we know we neglect. And the second thing is we are intentional. We don't settle for superficial change. We read out, weed out, not read out, weed out the deep roots of sin. So this is found in God's response. And if you're looking at your handout, you can see what the Lord told him. And I have taken the whole chapter and put it here. So I'm going to read it from the chapter because I want you to understand and for us to notice what God's response is to Joshua's pity party. His response is get up and getting up is the tipping point to reversing your setback into a comeback. 
because you're only defeated when you're knocked down. And let me read it for you. Joshua 7, starting at verse 10, the Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of my devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. And that's why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you. Joshua's answer was to feel depressed and sorry for himself. And for those of us who have done the very same thing, we know depression can affect our ministries, our families, and specifically our own outlook on life. I know. We know that they can, it can affect us to the point that we feel immobilized. But the Lord's response is worth noting. And the elders' mourning was, the Lord's response was, get up. And that's what God's cure for a pity party is, for us to stay, to stand back up, to get back up. Because you see, staying down is not going to solve the issue. And it's really hard to get up, isn't it? I know after I lost my first husband in a motorcycle accident, it was a choice. It was hard to do to get going every single day to have a plan to have my coffee maker set so that it would be waiting for me when I got up. But it was actually putting one foot in front of the other for every hour of those days after the death and after when I was planning his service. But back to Joshua chapter 7, verse 18. There was a reckoning here for what God had Joshua do. Joshua had to have the family come forward one by one, man by man. And Achan, son of Zimri, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, was chosen. And Joshua said to him, Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel. Tell me what you've done. Don't hide it from me. And Achan said, it's true, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I've done. And he told him what he did. When I saw the plunder of a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and I took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with silver underneath. And so Joshua sent messengers. And they ran into the tent, and there it was, hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. And they took the things from the tent and brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites and spread them out before the Lord. And here's what we can notice from this. It's only when Achan got caught that he admitted that he had stolen these things. Achan was given many opportunities. I mean, think about it. They went through each one of the tribes, think of how long that took, man by man, tribe by tribe, individually. And I don't know how far down in the line Aiken was. Sue is a BSF teaching leader, so she probably knows how long that took, right? <laughs> but um, what I do know is that we can learn from that. Instead of trying to hide what we've done from God, if God's convicting us about something, keep a short account and allow God to bring us back close to him and accept responsibility. And that's what's so difficult for some, some of us is to say, yes, Lord, I know it's something that I didn't come to you and ask you about before we made this decision. And I want your will. I want your um, direction and I want your favor in this new battle, the fresh anointing, that's what it's about, is going to God and asking God to show us any area where we need to take responsibility for our sin in it. So Achan had been given many opportunities to confess his sin, but he remained silent. And you and I can learn from this to be careful not to settle for the superficial instead of dealing with the deep roots and letting God pull those out for us, and to agree with God about our condition. First John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, 
he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we have to be willing to agree with God about our condition. It's not about beating ourselves up. If you feel condemned, that's from the accuser of the brethren. Satan is our enemy. But conviction is from the Holy Spirit. And we need to be reminded that condemnation is not the way God wants us to feel about our sin. It's about con conviction and confession and agreeing with God that the blood of Jesus has covered all of those things. And we don't have to worry all about any more about it, but just stay in our position in Christ, which is standing firm that God has forgiven us for our sins. So like Adam and Eve, who did the first sin, Achan lost sight of the character of our generous God. And when we as leaders choose to be thankful, praiseful, confess our sins, and praying for others, that's how we stay in touch with that soft spot and sweet spot of our anointing. So it's so important to stay connected to God through our own personal daily devotion times with him and then throughout the day as we choose maybe a portion of scripture to think about, to memorize, or even just to marinate in throughout the day. It keeps our minds renewed, but it also keeps our own soul connected with God throughout the day. We cannot overlook or skip our daily personal time with God nothing else can take its place. Psalm 73, 25 reminds us of this. It says, whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. We can remind ourselves that the battle takes place in the heavenly realms, and that's crucial to overcoming the enemy. We behave according to what we believe. So let's review our three points before we go on to point number three. So first, first is to be mindful, examine the areas of your life that you neglect and how you can do that, how you can get realigned is through praise, through thanking God, through confession and through prayer. Number two, be intentional. And that's don't just settle for superficial change, weed out the deep roots of sin and ask God how or what areas that he is bringing to, to the surface and just tell him, I don't want to hide anything from you. I mean, basically God knows all about it anyway, right? And some of us are really good at hiding or pretending. And I know I was there for years. I didn't know what to do to um, know or to be reminded of what God tells me is true about myself. I didn't know my identity in Christ. I didn't know that because of the finished work of Jesus, I am accepted, I'm secure, and I'm significant. Not because of anything I've done, but because of the finished work of Jesus Christ for you and for me. The last point is to be encouraged. God can use your setback for your comeback. He can use your setback as a set up for your comeback, a new fresh start. But you know, it really depends on you. Sometimes people, they want, they want us to say, well, I want to hear that God is going to do something. Well, he is, he already is, but it really is our responsibility to be cooperative with him in his ways and his timing, right? So let's go back to chapter eight. I don't know if you have your Bible open, but after Israel returned to the Lord and dealt with Achan's sin, they are back on track. And God showed Joshua and revealed a new strategy for dealing with AI. And this happened in chapter eight. But I'm going to just remind you of the different words that God has used all throughout the book of Joshua that are so encouraging to us. One is found in Joshua 1.9, and it is something that I used to tell my kids a lot, be strong and courageous. And that's what God tells Joshua in Joshua 8.1. He says, 
Then the Lord says to Joshua, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Take the whole army with you. Go up and attack Ai, for I have delivered them into your hands, the king of Ai, his people, and his land. Notice something about this. This is just like the first battle. What's different is this time God is doing the fighting. God is going to use this thing that set them back to perform a victory. And don't you know, these guys were probably going, oh, I hope God comes through. Well, no, they were trusting that God would. Hoping is presumption. Hoping is trusting in faith. But stepping out and telling ourselves, I'm going to be strong and courageous because my God is going to be victorious. So what happened is, and this is just a really cool story. If you like to read about battles, victorious battles, not the other side of the, um, the con being conquered or people dying, but Israel pretends to run away from AI. And just like the first battle, but this time 30,000 men have been waiting all night on the Northern side of the city to occupy the empty city and burn it. And AI is caught in the middle and is defeated. The success of the battle of Ai was dependent on God's blessing. And as long as Joshua stretched forth his javelin and petitioned the God, the victory was Israel's. And I think of this as those of us who have been ministering with the different challenges in the days that have gone by, but also in the days ahead, as we continue to petition God and to wait on God, that's the hardest part, isn't it? It's when God kind of moves us into a place where we feel like we're not going anywhere. It's when we feel like maybe we're on the sidelines. We don't like that very much, do we? Because we would prefer to be on the front lines doing the ministry. Years ago, being set off to the sidelines happened to my first husband, Pastor Paul and I. He had one day we were really best friends with our senior pastor and his wife. In fact, we were going over to their house that night for dessert and we received a phone call that changed our lives. And the phone call was that the pastor asked Paul to turn in his resignation. And we had, we, we, we'd done nothing wrong. There was no sin in our ministry. We find out about 18 months later that the reason why this all happened was because the pastor wanted to bring in his best friend for Paul's job. And in order to do that, of course, the job had to be vacated. So for us as a young pastoral couple to find out that Paul was going to be out of a job and I was going to be the sole supporter of our family with only a part-time position that I wasn't good at. I was a daycare provider and it wasn't much money, but I also, I wasn't good at daycare. I don't know if some of you can relate. Some of you are really good at it and I admire you, but I wasn't one of you. So um, I, I was like, you mean I got to keep doing that? Well, I did because I, there was no choice. Bottom line, we went through a lot of feeling like, what did we do wrong? What did we do to deserve this? And we asked a lot of questions. And we also, like Joshua, had a lot of pity parties. A few months later, at our new church, we heard about a seminar that was coming, and it was called Resolving Personal and Spiritual Conflicts. And it was taught by a man that we never heard of. It was taught by Dr. Neil T. Anderson, and we found out that he was a professor at Talbot Seminary, and Paul and I were both Biola graduates, so that kind of perked our ears. We kind of thought, okay, maybe he has something that we need to know about, but when we heard about the um, description of what the seminar was going to be about, we thought we really needed to go because we definitely had some personal and spiritual conflicts that needed resolving. But at first we thought, well, we'll just go and Friday night, it was a Friday night and an all day Saturday at our new church. And we, we learned on Friday night that it was much more than we ever thought it would be. What Dr. Anderson asked us to do on um, that first night was to go home and make a list of the people who had wronged us. And I thought, there is no way that I want to do that. I did not want to deal with anything like that, even though 
I really thought that there would be a time someday that I would. But that night as I got home and talked to Pastor Paul about it, he said, well, I'm doing it. I'm doing it tonight. And he was a, always a night person, which I wasn't. But um, I realized that maybe I should go and ask God what he wanted me to do. So I did. And so I went in the other room and I started writing down names of people who had wronged me throughout the years that I had not really dealt with. I didn't know what to do. So I started making my list of people, wrote down 10 names, 20 names, all the way up to 30, then 40, and then 50. Turned out that my list was 75 people. Yeah. Did I have some things that God wanted to resolve? I did. And now I realized that it was time. It was time to do that. I didn't really want to, but God said, you know, Cheryl, I'm going to be with you. So we go back to the seminar the next day, and I thought, there is no way that this guy is going to allow us any time to go through my list. I mean, my list was probably the longest one in the whole room. And this, this was a big church. The main sanctuary seated 1,000 people. I think at that time, the conference probably maybe five to 600 at the time. But what Dr. Anderson did that next morning was just amazing. He said, okay, folks, we're going to take all the time that we need to go through this. And what I want you to do is I want you to turn around and make your pew an altar. And I want you to spread this out before the Lord. Friends, that was really hard. But what I realized is that I didn't have to do this alone, that God was going to help me go through these li the list of people that needed, that I needed to forgive because I was carrying around something that God never meant for me to carry around. He wanted me to roll these burdens onto the capable shoulders of our Savior. And I've got a couple of scriptures that I want to share with you. One is 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become a righteousness, the righteousness of God. What God did for us that day is a term that I've learned called sacred surgery. And when we allow God into those places that often are not comfortable or that we've tried to hide or pretend like everything is A-OK -okay because it's just too painful to face. With the Holy Spirit's help, I learned that day that I could let God open me up, if you will. Some of you, you've had surgery. You know, it's pretty messy. And that's the same thing with the sacred surgery. It's pretty messy. But yet, I did not need to be afraid or postpone it any longer. It was so amazing to show God my hurt and also let go of my hate that I've been carrying around some of that stuff for 20, 25 years. And it was amazing what happened when I declared God's word, but I also submitted to his plan and I understood what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not. And some of you have taught this, so you, you know what this is all about. It helped to cut away things through the sacred surgery, like resentment, pride, the attitude of, I don't need God's help. I don't need anybody's help. And I think one thing that I've learned about myself is I'm like, Sue, I need people. Because when you're with yourself all the time, I mean, yeah, I'm with God too, but as I'm in my office quite a bit, it's not good for this woman to be alone. <laughs> I love my people. I love my groups. And I can't wait for some of the times when I'm out talking to people in person. I'm so grateful, though, for this opportunity. But I do feed off the audience quite a bit. And some of you know that. Like right now, I would imagine that I'm going to be, I would be able to get eye contact with some of you about this very subject because you've heard this teaching before. But what happened to me that day is I asked God to reveal 
things that I believed that were lies. I asked God to cut through some of the snarls, some of the traps that the enemy had laid for me that I didn't know. You know, when you're deceived, you don't know it. And there were lots of areas that I was being deceived in, but God turned on the light that day through his word. And I understood some of the areas of unforgiveness for what they were. And that way I could understand the truth of another scripture about forgiveness, which is 2 Corinthians 2, 10 through 11. 2 Corinthians 2, 10 through 11. It says, anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan may not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Because of the finished work of Christ on the cross and the strength of the Holy Spirit, God will help us find and remove any spiritually toxic infection. In Hebrews 12, 15, some of you know this one very well too. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God so that no bitter root causes up or grows up to cause trouble and defile many. So in conclusion, we can learn from every single battle that we face. And there are some battles that we've lost, but the good news is it's not over. That God's not through, he's not finished. And maybe you today are stuck and you need a breakthrough. And real change can only happen when we choose to get specific. So be mindful. Number one, be mindful. Ask yourself, are there areas of neglect in my life? Am I experiencing regret? Take courage that through praise, through thanksgiving, through confession and prayer, you can be restored. Number two, be intentional. Don't settle for superficial change. Don't settle for imitations. Seek out real change. Deal with the roots of sin. Don't give them over to destruction. Don't try and hide from God because really what you're doing is preventing your own healing. Agree with God about your condition. Be confident and have faith that God is going to take your setback and set you up for a comeback. Understand how to access God's truth. That ushers us into a place of peace. And we are much more confident in God and not our own strength. There's a quote in your handout it says, with the Holy Spirit's help, we can choose total honesty and dependence, and we can face our pain and show God our hurt. Amazing things happen when we declare God's word, submit to his plans, and rely on his power. And that's our choice. So the third point, be encouraged. God can use your setback as a comeback. It's a new, fresh start. And some of us, wow, we really liked it the old way. We, um, one of the things that's happening with our church here, I attend Canyon Hills Church, and we, for the first time we went, we went into our sanctuary in 2020 in March. We were in there for a while. We had to take appointments. We, we couldn't go unless we had an appointment, but then the staff decided that they were gonna get a large outdoor tent. And the outdoor tent, we started meeting at 930 in the morning, but everyone was there. So the tent seated about a thousand people. Well, when we decided because of the Bakersfield summers, it's 115, even at 930 in the morning. So they moved us into the sanctuary in mid-July of this year. But one of the things that they're saying is we're never going back to the way we were, because guess what? We're all meeting together as one body. And we before this, we had four services. So yes, it's a lot of people, it's crowded, and we do have some that prefer to wear masks, and that's fine. However, what I'm getting at here is you and I have to make that choice. Our world has totally changed, and we won't be going back. Are we going to tell the Lord, no, I don't like this very much? Are we going to have our own little pity party? Are we going to be whining and, and complaining in our own selves? you know what, that kind of thing, we cannot keep it to ourselves. It's going to come out somewhere. I know because I've decided I'm not going to let any 
thing come out of this mouth that isn't going to be glorifying to the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean I don't get real every now and then, but I do catch myself and I go, okay, Lord, I know we are not going back. We're going to have a fresh anointing for these days ahead. And none of us look forward to going through trials, right? But when we take time to ask God to show us any way that we're being deceived, any way that we're holding on to bitterness, any way that we're holding on to hurt or anger, when we permit him the opportunity, the time to have his way, amazing things happen. Galatians 5.1 says, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So in your handout, you see there's a couple of prayers down at the bottom. And this is a really important prayer to pray because like I said earlier, when we're deceived, we don't know it. So you can pray this prayer and there's no magic in praying a prayer. However, sometimes it really helps to have some words so that we can begin to put into words or practice things that God has shown us. So um, since you're all on mute, I'm going to ask you to pray this all out loud with me. And then we're going to say a declaration. Remember, there's nothing magic. It's not a magic incantation. It's just speaking what's all the way already true about you. So are we ready to pray this prayer? And then I will close in prayer. Ready? Dear Lord, Lord, please show me any way. Any, can, you mute, can you mute yourself, Carol? Can everybody mute yourself? Yeah, that's great. Okay. Ready? Dear Lord, please show me any way, I'm sorry, any area where I am being deceived. I declare James 4, 6, and 7, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I choose to submit to you because I choose to resist the devil or say no. I believe that he will run away. That's leave me alone. God, I want to be close to you, and I believe that you will come near to me and give me peace and strength. In Jesus' name, amen. And now let's say the declaration. I declare God will use my setback as leverage for my comeback. I declare no weapon formed against me will prosper. I declare God will change the delay into a deeper dependence on his power. And let me close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this sweet time with your people. Thank you, Father, for the example of Joshua. And Lord, we learned so much from your word today. Help us to remember that you want us to consecrate ourselves before you. And Lord, help us to be drawn to our time with you so that we don't go ahead without it, so that we don't go forward without coming close to you and saying, Lord, show me any area where I'm being deceived. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. We love you. We bless you. And we, we just commit our days ahead to you. Thank you for turning our setback into a comeback for your glory. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Um, I don't know if you came thinking you were going to have a, a one, two, three thing, you know, of um, this is what you do and just, you know, do this step and do this step and do this step. But what she gave us was much more than a, a simple to do. It was a looking inside. It is a God doing his inner work before we could ever do anything uh, for him. We need to be who he wants us to be. And I greatly appreciate it. I think so many times we are, are people who want to um, do instead of be and he, she is definitely uh, giving all three points with a B so that we would be, be mindful, be intentional, be encouraged. Um, what are some comments or questions that you have? If you would, um, oops, what is that? Um, uh, Jerry, 
I don't know what that is, but he could remove it. I don't know what that is. I have a pro account, so I don't know why we're getting this warning. Is there any way that you could- um... Just stop sharing. Oh, just stop sharing. Yeah, stop sharing with everybody. Well, there you yeah. go. There you go. Thank you. That was like, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Um, listen, this is life, right? Can't help those glitches. But um, the comments of perhaps what you are going through or an amen to the truth that she's given um, or any questions that you might have. If you would just unmute yourself and share. I'm going through my notes. Um, I know someone said, thank you, Jesus, Maria. Thank you, Jesus, for a fresh anointing. Praise God. We could all use that right now. Amen. I think I was personally convicted on the neglecting part. You know, I, I think sometimes we don't realize what we neglect. We um, don't. And I, I think even, even something as, um, I, I don't know if the word is common, but something that's expected of us, something that could even be routine, like spending time with, with, with the Lord and she was encouraging us to do that. It seems like so almost mundane because that's just so that should be part of your life right yeah if we want a fresh anointing then that's absolutely necessary and not not to put it as a check off you know what i right. mean so right. you get you get you you now don't have to feel guilty because at least i spent time in the word you know at least i prayed a little bit and so right. just click it off but it's it's so that it's meaningful and we're taking time to listen to the lord it's it's spending that time and it's just so easy to let it. Yeah. Yes. I have a question here from Kent Nossaman. He's one of my good friends, but he's also one of your board members. Do you want me to answer that? Please. Okay. So that. he said, and this is a really good question. I'm sure that others have been thinking and Kent's been in ministry a long time. Have you ever had to seek out those who hurt you and ask them to forgive you? Uh. Anybody, anybody relate? Now I'm getting goosebumps. No. So um, let me just use Paul and my pastor, Paul and my illustration from when all of this happened. And some of you who've been in my seminars at CMTA, you probably heard the story before because I use it in giving up the grudge seminar, the finding freedom through forgiveness. It's, it's what happened with that, with that time of forgiveness with Neil Anderson. Um, I, I had to let go of the hate and the expectations that I had on the head of the board of elders of the church that let my husband go, the pastor. And those two were the main people that I just, I did not want to forgive them. I didn't think they deserved it because of how the whole thing went down. And the other I haven't explained all of it. It was very, very painful. Some of the things that we were told to do and not do. So I didn't seek them out, but what I had to do was the work to forgive them because I didn't think they deserved it. Do we deserve God's forgiveness? No. What was the last thing that Jesus said as he was hanging on the cross? He said, what, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. So do you guys think that forgiveness was an important thing for God to, for us? So God's given us an amazing gift in offering forgiveness to people who don't deserve it because, hey, we're there. We're, we're them, right? All of us are. It's offering God's forgiveness. It's offering God's grace. And it's offering that whole thing of, I'm not going to hold this against them. 
So it's loving with 1 Corinthians 13, 5 love. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says love keeps no record of wrongs. And you guys all know that's one of the hardest things to do, especially in church and ministry, because you and I were all list keepers. Hey, we keep a list. I've got my list right here from this week of all the stuff that I had to do. This is my list from every day for a whole week. I keep them on these little sticky note things. It seems to work for me. Uh, sometimes I lose a sticky note, then I'm in trouble. But, but what I'm talking about is God does not hold our past against us. God does not hold our offenses against us. And that's the way we are supposed to love people. And that is the hardest thing for our flesh because we want the score to be even. They don't deserve to be forgiven, do they? No, they don't. So talking about the elders, the elder and the um, senior pastor, I was working after Paul and I left that church and we'd gone to the Neil Anderson seminar. This was about a year later. We had both decided that we probably could not trust Christians ever again. Paul had been a pastor and he decided he would not work at a church again until God changed our plans. The same thing for me. So I was working as a social worker. One of my clients wanted me to meet them at Denny's. I was in Denny's right here on Buck Owens Boulevard. And um, I just finished with my client. And guess who I saw? The board of elder, the president of the board. And I was like, oh, dear. To myself, I did not want to see that guy. I thought it'd be easier if I just walk out the back door. He would not, he didn't see me, so it wouldn't have made a difference. But then I took a deep breath and I thought, I am not being fake here. I said, Lord, I need your help. I'm going to go say hi. And he started asking me questions. He said, well, how are you guys doing? We, we hope you're doing well. We've been praying for you. I had no idea. I thought we might as well as dropped off the face of the earth, right? Okay, so he asked me specific things about how we were being cared for. He said, we, we assigned people to take care of you. And I said, what? We haven't heard from anybody. He said, really? This person told me that they did blah, 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 blah. And I said, no, nothing's happened. He said, oh. So anyway, bottom line, God ordained a meeting where we met with the senior pastor, the president of the board, Pastor Paul and myself, and we explained what had been done or not done. And we had kept a list, a phone log. It was back in the day of answering machines. You guys remember those? <laughs> and we wrote down all the days and times that people called because for, for us, we needed it. We, we wanted encouraging, encouragement. We didn't do anything wrong. And then, um, things that we got in the mail. I kept them in a notebook. So we brought all this stuff to the meeting and we showed them and the pastor and the president of the board were just shocked because they had assigned the care of us, the follow-up to someone that didn't do it. And do you know, they said, we are so sorry that that happened that way would you guys forgive us? And they actually started crying. I mean, it was like so humbling. And here I am with three men that are crying. And of course, I'm just like, by that time, just bawling. But anyway, no, we did not seek them out and ask them to forgive us. But what God did is he showed them that there was a different side of us. And then we find out the reason why. Paul was asked to leave was because the pastor's best friend was then now then working. But yeah, it just freed us in so many ways. And I'm watching your comments over here. So some of you know, and maybe you're in the middle of it right now, but yes, Valerie, that's right. She says, sometimes we forget that they are human and they really did try really hard and they meant well. Um, so uh, yes, Oh yeah, Colleen's praising the Lord. She says, Lord, thank you for our moisture in the forest this morning. So often we pray for rain and then we're surprised when you bring it. Your rain quenches the fires around us. And um, yeah, we need to keep praying. Colleen, thank you, Lord, for Colleen. Colleen um, has been a good friend of mine. Her and 
she and Pastor Jerry Goodman, they used to bring a whole busload of people from First Baptist Lake Isabella to CMTA when he was a pastor there. And now they've moved several times, but she came on today. She lives in Santa Cruz now and Pastor Jerry will always be Pastor Jerry. He married my, um, my new husband and I um, when we got married, you know, when I got remarried. So anyway, thank you, Colleen, for saying that. Um, just thanking, thanking the Lord for people that, for all of you who stayed with us through the end, you guys rock. <laughs> Do we have any more questions or, or comments? Absolutely, forgiveness is the key to moving forward. I think it's a message that we all need to hear um, repeatedly. It is. Now, Maria, are you, are you with Pastor Victor up in Visalia? I'm just asking Maria Vasquez if she's the same one because these people, they were from Bakersfield too. So I don't know if it's, there probably are several Maria Vasquez's in the world. <laughs> so anyway, it's awesome to, to just see that the Lord is bringing so many people. So, you know, we are all, as leaders, we can't not um, forgive people. And it's so difficult to do in some ways, but the bottom line is we do need to give ourselves a lot of grace to forgive ourselves for any way that maybe we felt like we failed ourselves. But, um, oh yeah, it is Maria Vasquez in Visalia. So, but I also wanna just encourage you guys to, to just, we can't forgive God, but we can say to the Lord, you know, Lord, I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed that blah, blah, blah. Um, there's lots of things that have changed and keeping that open communication between us and God is very important. And, and often when I'm talking with people, women, men, leaders, I think, you know, I, you know how it is when you say, I wish God would fill in the blank or, um, like for you, most of us are praying for prodigals, um, prodigal adults are lots harder to trust God with than prodigal kids at home even though when they're right underneath your feet, you're like, oh, I wish you would just go away. I was a prodigal juvenile delinquent. So I know what I'm talking about. My mom would, she wanted to get rid of me so many times, but she loved me. She let God's love cover a multitude of my sins. I mean, seriously. But I thank God that God helps us to say, Lord, I've been disappointed with you. And it's not like you did anything wrong, but my expectations were here. And so help me, help me to see that that's an area that I'm being deceived is, you know, we would all like some of the things to go back the way they were. And yet when they don't, we have to just be able to say to the Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust our leaders and I'm going to, you know, pray for them, man, our pastors, they need our prayers. All of you pastors right now, it's a difficult time to be a pastor or leader because we're all adjusting. Renata, you have your hand raised. Would you like to? I did. I was just in, in uh, thinking about this story when Aiken sinned. He was the one that committed that sin, but his entire family suffered as a result of it. And that, that was one thing that you know, sticks with me with that story is, wow, one person I mean, he might probably had a few people help him gather up the things and hide it, but there were people in his family didn't know what he did yeah. until, until they found out, but they all had to pay the price. That's good. Yeah. Very sobering thought. Any others that would like to make a comment? Appreciate that so much. And Thank you, Kent, for bringing out the forgiveness. Um, because like I said, I think it's key to, honestly, I think if we, if we were honest with one another, all of us have forgiveness issues one time or another. And so it's like an important um, topic. And My, subject, yeah. When you were talking about spiritual toxins, infections, in today's climate, we are filled with them all around us. 
So Cheryl, it is so refreshing to be in God's word and to be reminded of these truths with all that we are bombarded with all these toxins. Um, just, you know, SIS, stay in scripture. <laughs> you know, Amen. like Cheryl. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Such a great reminder. We have to just... Uh, Keep our mind renewed on God's word and stay with, well, if we can, with his people as much as possible. So let's get mutually encouraged. Amen. Amen. Yes, uh, uh, Celia. Um, yeah, that was very powerful, especially when you had to write down all those <laughs> that make that list of those who had either wounded you or who you were, you know, not in good, good thoughts about. And um, my sister and I recently made a trip home. We did lose one brother to COVID and he had been a pastor of a church that quite a few of my siblings attended. And so we were able to go home and they had all parted ways um, for different reasons, um, not good reasons. But we were able to go home and just kind of sit with them. And we elected to visit them, each one separately. Mm -hmm. And I have nine siblings. And we just sat with them, validated where they were, and just reminded them of how much God not only loves us, but loved him. Mm -hmm. That he loved our brother very much. And that he worked through his ministry to bring others to Christ. And... We can let that go. Just be comfortable in that. And so it turned out to be a really good visit. Um, and we just sat present with them. We didn't go to fix them or to change them, but just to val validate the love that God has for all of us. And so that was very moving. Thank you for that. That's beautiful. That's just beautiful that you did that. Yes. yes. And I bet it was a blessing to you as well as to his family. Mm. Yes, it really was. And Joy says, thank you for showing the freshness of God's word and story we've read before. I just, that's one of the beauties of God's word. It's, mm -hmm. You can't ever get tired of it. You see it from different perspectives. It's always fresh and there's always lessons. Um, no. That's great. Yeah, I um, I learned a lot from this story. I was grateful to um, get to dig in. So, um, and you know, when we do that, we have to really wrestle with. We want to be able to let God's word change us, not just teach it, but change us too for what He has next, and to let Him show us something new. And um, that was really neat, Bernetta, that you mentioned that about Aiken. Um, but the other thing is to continue to just be honest with God about what we're doing. And I know most of us, our ministries have changed because we are, some of us, not able to meet in person. But that's been a caution for me to just kind of not be adding things to my schedule again, just to be doing because it's been so good to just be able to sit as long as I need to and study and enjoy the time with him. So, um, but if you're looking for a Bible study, I'll be leading a virtual Bible study. I just found out from Freedom in Christ, the USA office this week, it's going to start on September 9th at 4.30 PM. And it's a pilot. So we are going to be using my new book, and I don't have the link handy in, on this computer. It's on my laptop, but um, I can get that to you if you want to check it out. And what's the study itself is free, but the required materials are the Unraveling the Line Up book and then the pamphlet of the Steps to Freedom in Christ. And the book is three, uh, three months, so it'll be every Thursday afternoon from 4.30 to 6. Uh, the reason why we're doing it at 4.30 in the afternoon, my co-leader has done these types of groups before. I never have. But she said, you know, Cheryl, if anybody from the East Coast wants to join, then it's better if we do it a little earlier than um, like for them, if we did it 7 p.m. or 7.30, it's just too late. 
So that's why we're doing it at 4.30 in the afternoon. So if that sounds interesting to you and you'd like to be a part of it, I'd love for you to join in. And we'll be talking about forgiveness again. Um, it's in chapter five of the book, but you can see that it's something that God continues to say, Cheryl, you better do this <laughs> because you teachers know when you're teaching, God has you, you're, you've got to do what you tell people to do. And that's not just telling you're, you're saying, I'm not going to teach this without doing this. <laughs> so. Cheryl, when you uh, get more information, can you send it to me and I will forward it to the people sure. who signed up for this uh, uh, Zoom uh, meeting and uh, they would uh, benefit from your September 9th uh, presentation? That'd be great. I'd love that. Sure, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you for sure. sending that out. Yes, it's on. It's like I said, it's on my other computer, the link directly to sign up for it and all of the above. So good. Great. And give us the name of your newest book again, because I think yeah. Let me show there. it to you. It's right back here. It's called Unraveling the Lie Knot, and the subtitle is Finding Freedom from the Tangles of Discouragement, Deception, and Depression. Wow. And no, the, the, the teaching that I did today on Joshua seven is not in here, mm. but the teaching that I did on the soul surgery, that's in chapter 10, it's a sacred surgery. And I talk about that because that's something that I really believe that most of us, we do, and we don't like have a, a name for it, but, um, most of you know what that's about. And it's no fun, but it also, it's, it's, it's helpful to say, yeah, I know what to do. I just need to do it first before I can share it with other people. So when's our convention going to be, Sue? Do you know yet? Well, that is such a good question. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we don't know exactly when it's going to be because we need to get a place. We're thinking it's going to be uh, because there are so many unknowns and to be at the convention center in Pasadena, we really need larger numbers. And uh, we're not sure how many people are willing to come. We are, I'm willing, but I don't know about other people willing to come into a larger facility yet. So um, we are looking for a place as in a church. So if you know of a church who would love to have us, we would love to at least begin there. And then our, our goal is to get back to the center because that's like a second home for us. It's just wonderful. So we're looking for a place. Um, it probably will be not, you know, to the large scale that it had been, but it's definitely needing the, the, the training, equipping, the encouraging, the inspiring, all that is very needed. So that's what we're working on right now. We will be making announcements, but I would like to make an announcement about the next um, Zoom session presentation that we're going to be having. If you've been to our conventions and you know Mark Schaffler, and he is another one of the fan favorites <laughs> from our convention, and he's going to be sharing on October 23rd. Um, we were talking about uh, the, the new normal, and um, one of the things that that has been, that's been on our hearts um, when I was talking with Mark is about discipleship. You know, there's a difference between a convert and a disciple. Um, oops, excuse me. I'm gonna have to see, this is what, <laughs> anyhow, there's a difference between um, a, um, a convert who, you know, we, we want people saved obviously, but a disciple is one who follows Jesus one who is um, wanting to be more like him and growing, and that's what we want. Um, so this new normal and the new normal that we're, that we're gonna be facing now, and, and um, we, we really want people to be disciples, and that's what uh, our emphasis is going to be. It's a very needed one, and so please mark, uh, October 23rd, it'll be 10 p.m. It'll be just like uh, this one and we'll be sending out uh, information. 
we want you to know CMTA is alive and we are moving forward. So uh, you'll be hearing more information as we get that information, but um, creating a new normal is his title. Um, so please mark that date. Now, do you have any other questions or comments before we, before we close? I am so delighted and I hope that you will be able to uh, uh, come in and uh, be a part of uh, Cheryl's um, Bible study. I do wanna give this website address to you again, www.cheryl, that's S-H-E-R-Y-L-G-T.com, www.cheryl, uh, gt.com. It has a wealth of information and I just so thoroughly enjoyed, I just perused through her whole um, website. I just kept scrolling down each one of the tabs and looking and learning. And um, it was, I, I didn't know there was so much there. So you, you need to do that. We'd love for you to do that with our CMTA uh, convention.org uh, website as well. Um, so if there's nothing else, this is your last chance. Okay, let's pray. Father, for this wonderful time, for this very practical and personal sharing this morning, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would take those specific points that you know we need, that we will not just say, oh, that was good, and then forget it. Oh, Father, that your Holy Spirit would just now, right now, dig deep, pierce our hearts with your truth, whether it be forgiveness or neglect or any specific point that we would be mindful and intentional and be encouraged, that we would take what we've learned and then apply it. Thank you for what you're going to do. Lord, we don't want to be the same we want to be changed by you, that we would be true growing disciples, followers of you. Thank you. We welcome you now to the rest of our day, to the rest of our lives, because Lord, we want to be like Jesus. In whose name we pray, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Hopefully Bye. we'll see you in September. Yes. And see you uh, October 23rd, okay? And awesome. September for the Bible study, September 9th. Right. And Jerry will send out that information. Awesome, awesome, thank you. Thank you. Hugs to you all. Yes, thank I you. Hugs. <laughs>